What's up, fuckers? It's your boy, a tribe called Jack Slack, and it's the Fights Gone By podcast. Popping in for a quick one. Left it a little bit late in the week again because I'm terrible. Um, but we've got a fight. Well, we've got some fights coming up this weekend uh, on the UFC. There is also an Invicta. You, you, you don't want to hear about that. Um, and then there was a PFL earlier in the week. But we're focusing on the UFC this week. Um, not a lot of news, but what news there was was hilarious. But actually, no, there's a good bit of news. Zabit versus uh, Calvin Cater scheduled for October 18th in Boston. Bit of an odd one. Because we thought Zabit was getting, um, I'm going to go back to calling him Zabit because it's better. We thought Zabit was getting Ortega, which was an interesting matchup. And um, Ortega obviously coming off an unsuccessful bid for the featherweight title. You'd think that would move Zabit more into contention. But Cater is still an interesting opponent for him. In fact, you know, since Zabit's um, shortcomings have mainly been on the feet so far, Cater's quite an interesting matchup. Cater coming off a stoppage of Chris Fishgold and then a surprising one over Ricardo Lamas. Zabit obviously just fought uh, Jeremy Stevens, which is sort of like, you know, now you're top 10, mate, but also, you know, you can just sort of hang back a bit. But then, you know, it's weird how these things go because uh, Renato Mocano was on the cusp of title contention and now suddenly is two losses back to back. Cater's a strange one anyway because he's a kickboxer from is it Delagrate's gym, but he's he's well noted as a kickboxer, but was completely stumped by uh, Hanata Mokano timing low kicks when he stepped in. He seems obsessed with his straight hitting, you know, straight hitting gets boxers plums. But um, when you see him doing it well using his jab, his his straight right. Uh, he's pretty fucking slick. That one on Shane Burgos, for instance. Shane Burgos, pretty good at moving his head and pretty good at um, counterpunching too, but just completely stumped by Cater and, and knocked out cold. So we like that fight, even if it's not... Even if it seems a little bit of a detour, you know, because they could have gone they could have gone Ortega straight into that Holloway title shot. I suppose, you know, it's good for them building up the beat a bit. Um, for the people who d- who are doubting, it gives them more time to see him against good fighters. And for the people who don't know him yet, it gives them more time to see Zabit doing spinning shit. And of course, spinning shit softens the brain, and that makes you more willing to buy pay-per-views. And then the other piece of news was that Ken Shamrock is putting on a bare-knuckle one-night heavyweight tournament. Why is that hilarious? Firstly, because it's bare-knuckle. Secondly, because Ken Shamrock is not great with his money, let's be honest. <laughs> and... Uh, Also because a one-night tournament in a sport where you are almost guaranteed to be cut open. What you'll see is you'll see the first round of it and then the second, the the final of the tournament or the, well, it'll be semi-finals in the first fight because there's only four dudes in it. Oh, and they're they're people like Sokaju, by the way. So it's, oh, it's bad. Um, But what you're going to see is people get cut open in the first fight, go into the second fight, immediately just bleeding from everywhere without even being touched. But I'm fascinated to see how that plays out, and if they get paid, most importantly. Will Ken go in the back and ask for more money and then blade, as uh, Chael Sonnen always accused him of doing? So let's have a quick rundown of these fights going on. Well, UFC on ESPN 14, or ESPN Plus 14, sorry, not actually ESPN. ESPN Plus actually scored a bit of a victory this week because uh, they're going to be included with Disney... Is it Disney Plus? Whatever Disney's new streaming service is, which is why Disney pulled basically everything they own off Netflix. Do they also own all the Marvel stuff that's on there? I can't remember. I can't keep up. Disney base basically assume Disney owns everything. So yeah, they they hit like 2.5 million subscribers to ESPN Plus this week, uh, which ties in nicely with all the people buying Disney Plus. So we got a bit of a strange card. Um, It's really like a chance for a lot of guys who the UFC are sort of rolling out, a soft rollout, if you will, <laughs> of, of these hype trains. You've got some established names there. So you've got Tisha Torres versus uh, Marina Rodriguez, both uh, fairly accomplished in the strawweight division, both at least well known on in the UFC or known in the UFC. Um, but you've also got a load of um, interesting debuts. So you've got like uh, Luis Eduardo Garagori, who is coming in. Um, he's an undefeated is it Argentinian? Yeah, Argentinian prospect. Uh, and he's coming in against Humberto Bandone, who uh, is in the UFC already, but had lost his last two. And I think he was stopped in both of them. And if you've looked down uh, Gagori's record, Garagori rather, uh, he's a pretty serious finisher. So um, I'm guessing because we're in South America, we're in Uruguay or you are gay. I'm guessing that the idea is that he wins. But you've also got some really... Um, 
fascinating ones that are going off very quietly because everyone sort of looked at this card and gone meh and I was doing this too and it's mainly because I, I scan down and if I if I know both the names in the matchup I go okay cool awesome I know that that's relevant I can put it all together but in this one you've got a lot of people where you only know one side of the matchup but you go hang on a minute they're in the UFC now um so the ones I'm specifically talking about are Cyril Garn who if you've followed this podcast for any length of time you know I like and uh, I wrote a big study for the Patreon boys. If you're a Patreon boy or if you want to get in on the Patreon, go read that because we talked about switch hitting, uh, how hard it is for big men to do and how Garn's doing it. And also just look to how Garn's style has developed because he started out in uh, Muay Thai, like a lot of these French guys do. And French Muay Thai is very strange, even in like the professional levels. They make you keep the elbow pads on um, because that was one of the ways that they banned MMA. They were like, oh, elbows, they're just vicious. Um but, you know, similar to, like, Czech Congo, he was a gigantic black lad, and they said, come and learn to kickbox, uh, and he did well. And in that article uh, that I wrote for the Patreon boys, I touched on the sort of weird career path of Gunn, because he was a kickboxer, then he sort of stopped for a while, and then he had his first MMA fight in, uh, I believe it was Toronto, or Qu- uh, Quebec. Some, you know, one of the TKO shows in French Canada, and the reason that he did that was because, basically... French MMA didn't exist. It was outlawed. And and the weirdest part about the French MMA being outlawed is that it basically happened for the two years that Francis Ngannou was just storming through the heavyweight ranks. So anyone who saw Francis Ngannou went, fucking hell, I want to try some MMA. Uh, You know, if you saw Francis Ngannou, you'd probably be more inclined to go on. (laughs) I'm never going to try that MMA. I might meet Francis Ngannou. But um, if you were inspired by Francis Ngannou's success, and, you know, he's a... uh, Is it Cameroon he's from? And he was penniless and he made his fortune in MMA you know if you're looking at that and being inspired to to take up MMA and you know that the MMA factory in Paris is a good gym um because they produced Garn and uh Ngannou and you'll also see people like uh, Jerome Labana down there sparring but you would have nowhere that you could fight it's super weird so Cyril Garn was obviously promising because TKO put him into a title fight in his first fight with them in the first fight full stop you know basically unheard of um, but they'd obviously seen him and gone, fucking hell, this this lad's got something. Uh, he just battered his opponent in that fight. And he had three fights with TKO. Last opponent he had was actually a, a pretty re- decent... You know, we're talking about regional heavyweights. So in the grand scheme of things, bad. But still good for uh, for a heavyweight. Uh, the last guy he fought, Roger Souza, a bit like a, a derpy jackare. But uh, he was he was 8-1 at the time, and uh, he was good. Uh, and uh, Gunn just lit him up uh he was switch hitting skewering him with the jab you know he's, he's six foot four and he's got an 83 inch reach he's 250 pounds and he moves like kyoji horiguchi you know not not as cool as kyoji horiguchi or and can't keep it up as long as kyoji horiguchi because even kyoji horiguchi can't be kyoji horiguchi for the full extent of the fight you know we discussed this before tension versus kyoji uh, i was like silly you know this <laughs> firstly i was like this is uh, mayweather versus mcgregor for people who thought who pretended they were too good for that and i included myself in that but the interesting part for me was that the uh long distance bouncing into into bursting stuff the karate style stuff point karate style stuff you know that isn't a, a staple in kickboxing you don't see it a lot in kickboxing that doesn't mean it doesn't work but it, it is not suited to the kickboxing uh, meta you know and, and the rules of kickboxing and that's not like it's too deadly to work i mean like you watch leo de or someone like that they engage maybe three or four times around and and in between that they can clinch and wrestle and stuff like that take breaks uh not that wrestling is easy but you can take your breaks there where and also by just circling around and, and, and chilling especially in a big circular cage um but in kickboxing obviously squaring action is a lot more constant and while you might be able to bounce in on someone and surprise them in the first round, you've got to keep that up for three rounds. Uh, so where, that's where that like gloves up, shorter motion, more economical style really uh, comes to to uh, the front. So in the first round of, of Kyoji versus Tension, it, it, exactly what we expected to happen happened. Kyoji's uh, speed and uh, trickery and bouncing and closing that, starting at an extreme distance and closing it quickly, really caught Tension by surprise, but very quickly the more um, economical kickboxing style of tension took over. Now, scale that up to 250 pounds instead of a flyweight, uh, and you're talking about, a, you know, it's it's hard for him to be up on the balls of his feet and bouncing for the entire time. So uh, especially in, well, in all of his fights, actually, that haven't gone, you know, haven't stopped in like two minutes, uh, he does come down off the balls of his feet 
uh, he, he tends to do it more strategically. He'll he'll go like, okay, I'm going to bounce now, and then we're going to fight more kickboxing because he came up in kickboxing in Muay Thai, um, and then he'll go back to bouncing. You know, it's not a case of him going bounce, bounce, bounce. Fuck, I'm tired, and then stopping. You know, um, but it, it's an, an aspect of of the style, and I think that's where people like Garn are, are so interesting. It's you know, especially with people like Henry Cejudo and 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 that. It used to be like it'll take a really good point fighting stylist to pull that off in MMA. Whereas now we're seeing guys who came from wrestling backgrounds going, there's some interesting stuff in this point fighting stuff. I'm going to try and adopt it. And, you know, rather than having to be incredible at it to get away with it in MMA, what you've got to do is be great at other things and then you can use it without being worried about, like, getting dragged into a clinch or taken down or whatever. So Gunn's opponent for this one is uh, Rafael Pessoa. And he's 9-0, and which, you know, is about as legit as you get for a regional heavyweight, as we said again. Coming straight in off LFA. Hasn't fought in actually the best part of a year. These two are actually scheduled to fight in TKO uh, back in uh, March, but that fight was cancelled and now they've decided to redo it in the UFC, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, you know, there's there's every chance in the world that Garn just shits the bed here, but I'm saying that he's got a very interesting style, and if he can apply it consistently against better heavyweights as he's starting to fight, um, I think he's very exciting for the future of the heavyweight division. He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have the power of, say, like a Fran- of, of Francis Ngannou. I'm not going to say like a Francis Ngannou, there's only fucking one. But, you know, we're not talking about another Francis Ngannou, but we're talking about someone with similar physical attributes in terms of height, length, weight, um, but a, a much more slick sort of style. One of the things I really like, actually, um, and again, check out the the article on on this because uh, I, I drew special footwork diagrams and everything. But Gun, uh, you know, switch hitters aren't rare in MMA. Dudes just do it. You know, I was I was writing something about um, Magomed Ankalaev today, and and he's a switch hitter just as comfortably. But there's switching stances and hitting from both sides, and then there's actually switching stances in a clever way um because a lot of times once you meet someone who's competent if you just switch stances in front of them they're going to punch you in the face as soon as you switch you know uh gennady golovkin versus danny jacobs danny jacobs was doing well from both stances golovkin waited for him to change from orthodox to southpaw the moment he changed he just threw a right hand down the center before jacobs was set and ready to deal with it you know, a right-hand lead, which wouldn't have been an issue if he just stayed orthodox uh, in that instance. Uh, it happened to Mickey Ward, too. He used to switch, like, just for whatever reason, he'd do it straight in front of the opponent and they'd hammer him with the straight right. The other one is that, you know, a lot of the guys who switch it, because you are, no matter who you are, you're not going to be properly ambidextrous. There is not enough time to learn to fight competently exactly the same of both sides. You're going to favor certain things off certain sides. And even if you don't, your opponent's body and, and their stance is going to set up what you, what's available to you. You know, if you're fighting an orthodox opponent and they've got a good guard and they know what they're doing, your uh, left body kick, whether it's from orthodox or southpaw, is going to be more effective than your right body kick because it's going into the open side. And this is really obvious with guys like Pat Barry, you know, another um, heavyweight and a guy who switched stances. But Pat Barry would throw overhand right and uh, right low kicks from his orthodox stance. The moment he changed to his southpaw stance, you knew he was going to jump in with a lead right hook or throw his uh, left high kick. He did almost no left hand hitting from his southpaw stance. Um, And it was really obvious when he switched. You're like, oh, wait, head kick's coming now. The thing about switching stances in motion from side to side is that you keep your opponent moving. You keep vision in front of their... Sorry, you keep motion in their vision. They're looking at your upper body. Your upper body's constantly moving around. They're having to keep turning to face you. They lose track of which stance you're on. Uh, And, you know, that sounds like, how could you do that? But it's pretty easy to in the tense situation of actually fighting someone. Max Holloway versus Cub Swanson is my go-to example of someone switching stances in motion side to side. The other nice thing is that you keep turning the opponent so you know where their lead foot is. So if you're going to switch into... Uh, say, an open guard position, so they're orthodox and you're switching to southpaw, you know where their foot is, you can keep circling around it, and as you're circling, you can get your foot into the right position that is a dominant angle from southpaw. That is to say, as I switch to southpaw, I make sure my lead foot is outside of the opponent's lead foot. And by doing it in motion, it's a lot easier than if I'm standing in front of him as a southpaw, and he's going, yep, I just need to keep an eye on that lead foot. Well, there you go, I've done about five minutes already just plugging that article, go read it, but Cyril Garn, 
cautiously excited for him. There's always, you know, the chance that he gets sparked. Uh, and I, like I said, I was writing about Ankalaev this week um, because Unibet asked me to talk about, you know, unheralded prospects in the UFC. And I was thinking of Vicente uh, Luke, but I did a Filthy Casuals guide on him this week. Um, so I did Ankalaev because even though he's murdered his last two opponents and he murdered everyone before he got to the UFC and he was murdering Paul Craig, that loss just took a lot of the hype off him. Everyone was like, oh, now he's lost. You know, it, we're getting to that boxing point where we're like, oh, he's lost. Now now I can't listen to him until he's got like 10 wins on the trot. Anyway, the other big one uh, debuting this weekend is Rodolfo Vieira. Now, Rodolfo Vieira, if you've not heard about him for a while, I, you know, I bring him up from time to time when I get talking about like Toriando passing or switching sides as he passed the guard. Um... Because, you know, I remember him from his incredibly successful jiu-jitsu career. He sort of disappeared for the last few years, and I was like, what's he been up to? And then I realised, oh, he's been in MMA, <laughs> and uh, just been murking dudes, you know, all submissions with one ground and pound stoppage, you know, exactly what you expect from one of the best heavyweight jiu-jitsu guys ever coming to MMA, you know, especially at this level. There's no one going to be able to stop him. Would be interesting to see him against a really good wrestler. Uh, but obviously, you know, you have to get to like the top end of the UFC to meet the really good wrestlers who can actually fight now. Well, you know, Juan Adams is allegedly a really good wrestler. <laughs> it turns out he isn't. Um, but Rodolfo, uh, it's, it's it's interesting because I've always thought in my mind he is more of a gi guy or always was more of a gi guy. I can't remember. He must have won an ADCC at some point, but... You know, I, I remember him for getting control of the pant legs, ripping his leg free from the Della Heaver or whatever the opponent's holding, and then just running them ragged. You know, he'd run left, right, left, eventually get past. Just relentless pace for a heavyweight. And they used to call him the Black Belt Hunter because he was winning, like, Black Belt world-class tournaments as a brown belt uh, and submitting all these Black Belts. He's a very, very good grappler. Um and one of the interesting ones to watch that I, I think I've probably mentioned a few times now, but Rafa Mendes and him had a match in like Abu Dhabi or, or some somewhere where they were just play, paying blood money to jiu-jitsu competitors. But um, it, it wasn't the Abu Dhabi Combat Club that I normally am talking about when I say Abu Dhabi. It was like a, an individual event. And for some reason, Rafa and um, Rodolfo ended up against each other despite being very different weights and Rafa Mendes managed to keep him off for the entire time you know he didn't like submit him or sweep him or anything but to stop a guard passer of that quality from passing your guard with that much of a weight advantage should tell you that Rafa Mendes if you don't know who he is his guard is fucking amazing but now I've plugged Rafa Mendes let's get back into Rodolfo Vieira so he's fighting uh, Oscar P uh, Pichota who's another one who hasn't fought in a year. Uh, he's a, he is a UFC vet. He's had a, uh, three fights in the UFC now. Knocked out Tim Williams. Uh, yeah, I vaguely remember that one. But uh, lost to Gerald Mearshout. Holy shit, this is at middleweight. I'm so confused now. Because Rodolfo is heavyweight in grappling, um, and I know him from like the absolute division and so on, I just assumed he was fighting the heavyweight. No, he's fighting middleweight. God, this is going to get very interesting very quickly then because there are a lot of very competent um, grapplers and... Uh, wrestlers in the middleweight division. Oscar Pichota seems like a good matchup because he's got that loss to Gerald Mearshart in his last one. Hasn't fought in a year, so a little bit rusty. Also submitted by Gerald Mearshart because Gerald Mearshart probably not going to knock you out. <laughs> he's, he's a grappler. So yeah, Rodolfo got a good chance here, but also not like a walkover either. Then we got like actual match matchups, which are, are quite fun. Well, we've got Gilbert Burns going to uh, welterweight for the first time in his career against Alexei Konchenko. Konchenko's uh, undefeated 20 uh, 20 wins in 20 fights was the m1 welterweight champion came over slapped about tiago alves and then uh yushin okami though yushin okami you know ooh. that i think that was when yushin okami was brought back basically as a, he, he did a favor for them by fighting at light heavyweight against um ovin simpru despite having moved down from a career at middleweight to welterweight but then he went back to welterweight and fought yushin okami uh, sorry fought uh konchenko and lost um so Stiff test for Gilbert Burns. You know, Gilbert Burns, another amazingly accomplished jiu-jitsu player, has some good power on him. Um, who was it? Was it the Dan Moret fight where he just flatlined the guy along the fence and the guy felt, you know, he did the stanky leg? Um, but then he ran into Dan Hooker, who is going to spoil your day if you're not Edson Barbosa. <laughs> um, and has since bounced back with a decision over uh, Open Mercier and uh, he choked Mike Davies. He's decided that the weight cut's too much for him or he'll have more success with a bit more weight on him. So I'm excited to see him going up to welterweight. It is obviously a division stacked 
with or certainly the top end of it is stacked with very competent wrestlers um so i'll be and, and while burns is striking is improving and he's very powerful you know i i feel like he's not quite at that level where he's a multifaceted or you know a truly multifaceted threat i feel like he's the grappling he's got fucking loads of arm bars on his record which is which is awesome in the modern era and not being ronda rousey um but the grappling and big hitting power are not the same as being like an incredible grappler and a very good striker you know i'm just gonna see i'm gonna need to see a little bit more uh technical development or um certainly consistency in landing his big punches because you know he can go a whole fight just not landing big punches uh and, and then he'll meet someone else and starch him in a round whereas i like to see you know there's nothing wrong with with having a minimalist game you know a big punch and, and the strong grappling like Tyron Woodley but Tyron Woodley certainly you saw against like uh, Till getting much sharper at landing that one punch that he has then the other interesting stuff is you got Vulcan Uzdemir versus Ilya Latifi that was the one a little while ago we were like oh I didn't realize that's on this card now I'm excited and then uh, a moment after me dropping the podcast <laughs> they called that off um yeah that's not a bad fight I mean Ilya Latifi's always been sort of floating around the end the edge of title contention Vulcan Uzdemir is sort of well, the unlucky loss against um, Dominic Reyes uh, is is unfortunate, but you know he he got the title shot against uh, Daniel Cormier, was pretty easily handled in that one. Fought Anthony Smith, was winning, gassed out, got choked, uh, and then he fought Dominic Hayes. Looked probably the best I've ever seen him because you know I got into the the we all got into this mindset that he's like one punch, Mister One Punch. I saw loads of people commenting this on Reddit this week. They're like, "Well, I don't know if Alila TV can can avoid him for that long, and it only takes one." And you're like, "Well, no, most of Alila uh, of Volkanus Demir's career hasn't been it only taking one. Um, he looked a lot better against Hay- Reyes when he was just doing everything, you know, doing putting together combinations, wrestling, stopping takedowns, counter striking. You know, he had the whole package, and that's why I was so. It was very disappointing that he lost, but also probably better for the state of the division that Reyes won. Um, but you know, if you saw that fight, you probably don't consider it like a, a full on loss. So he's been looking very good, uh, and Elila Tifi, obviously enormously powerful, but really only going to be ducking in and then coming up with the left hook or the right hook. Or ducking in and trying to take you down. Uh, it throws the occasional monstrous low kick, but not very slick. You know, if you're if you're not very very slow, um, you should be able to get out of the way of them. But you know, Elila Tifi's got a bit of a cult following because you know, as much as I will never forgive him for having that fight with Gian Vellante, but then Gian Vellante can make a, a boring fight with anyone. Um, he he's submitted a lot of guys. He's knocked out a lot of guys. He's been around forever, um, and really only lost to the cream of the crop like Jan Blakowitz, Ryan Bader. Corey Anderson's a little bit more questionable, but Corey Anderson's about to have that fight with Johnny uh, Walker. And, and to be honest, that's one that Corey Anderson could win and everyone would be like, right, title contention. But really, you know, that's not talking about the fight. That's talking about the state of the lightweight divi- light heavyweight division. And that's really all there is to talk about here. Um, I think, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Uzdemir was looking really quite good in the grappling exchanges against um, Reyes. But obviously Reyes isn't Ilya Latifi. He's not relying entirely on what... Ilya Latifi relies entirely on his grappling and is monstrously strong. You know, everyone who's ever trained with Ilya Latifi, even even guys like Daniel Cormier, are like, I cannot believe how strong this guy is. And then Vicente Luque versus Mike Perry. Great fight. Go watch the Filthy Casuals Guide to Vicente Luque. Can't believe no one cares about this man. <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, this is the guy that Mike Perry's fighting. You're know, like, this guy has, what is it, like 11 fights in the UFC, nine wins, uh, never been finished. And every fight that he's won, he's finished. <laughs> you know, so that's that's the perfect fighter for um, most people. But genuinely, you know, they call him the silent assassin. Genuinely, he's got less attention than Perry because he's not as meme Again, did a whole video on this, but Luke's things are crisp counterpunching, especially going forwards. Uh, the cross counter, which is the right hand across the top of the opponent's left straight or jab. Um, that's how he starts his combinations, does really well off that. And... Um, the counter left hook so he'll go in with like a, a couple of punches and then step back and throw the le- just close the door with the left hook and he knocked out uh, Bilal Mohammed and Chad Lepre in exactly the same way very short left hook but they were just coming forward they were like it's my turn to punch now and just got laid out and the left hook king of the counter punches because he's going to come in from the side and it takes like four inches if you're throwing with your body and your hips rather than your arm it takes about like four to six inches you can hit someone hard enough to hurt them to at least stop them in their tracks uh, maybe not knock them out but he, he's managed it so well done to him and then on the ground he's all about the dars 
uh, and all about smashing through to the half guard and, and pursuing the Dars. Perry, again, the sport's most frustrating fighter because sometimes he fights to a level where you're like, his ability is clearly much more than we have seen. Uh, and then he'll go back to fighting like a bum. It's bizarre. Um, I think part of that is moving around a lot, changing camps, changing trainers, uh, broke up with his girlfriend, the Platinum Princess, who was one of his trainers and is in his corner, uh, got back together with her, married her, went to the Oliveira fight, looked really good. Um, but like the ones I'm thinking of, like the Jake Ellenberger fight, I think I talk about this every time we talk about my Perry, but Jake Ellenberger fight, he comes out throwing step up left uh, left kicks, giving Ellenberger fits with kicking. Uh, and then elbowing on it on the break of every clinch knocks him out with an elbow on the on the break. And then suddenly he'll come back against like Santiago Ponzinibbio or uh, even against, well, Danny Roberts was before that, but just walking forward swinging with his heels on the floor. Very peculiar. And then against Donald Cerrone, you know, he would have won that fight if he had a better corner, I think, if he had better coaches and a better game plan. Because Donald Cerrone, when he doesn't want to strike, he ducks in head first. You know, we, we talked about Don Cerrone's habits hundreds of times. Uh, Darren Till used my articles on Don Cerrone because I'd written so many when he was preparing for Don Cerrone, apparently. Someone on his team told me. Um, but, uh, you know, when he doesn't want to strike, he ducks in with his head. And it, it, it's been his, like, go-to at welterweight. And, but his takedowns aren't always great. It's really just the timing on the takedown that gets him the takedowns. Uh, and had uh, Perry worked to keep it on the feet, I think he tried to take... Uh, Cerrone down and then ended up on the bottom, didn't he? But had he just stayed on the feet or or worked to stay on the feet, he could have given Cerrone fits. You know, exactly the type of style Cerrone hates, up in your face, heavy hitting, is exactly the sort of style that Perry could have fought in that bout. Maybe not straight hitting, but um, certainly hitting him with enough power to, to uh, hurt his man. But got the decision over the over Alex Oliveira, which is interesting because I forgot that he actually won that fight. So he's in a pretty good position, and, and Vicente Luque Vicente Luque can steal all of that, which is great. Such a strange division that you know you think of Alex Alex Oliveira beating him doesn't get you ranked. Uh, you know, in my head, Alex Oliveira is like top fifteen guy. Interesting to see how this one turns out. And then in the main event, you've got Valentina Shevchenko versus Liz Carmouche. I'm going to be honest. I tried to get excited for this one, but Liz Carmouche. I forgot she was even still fighting because she's fought, I think, twice in the last two and a half years. You know, I thought she was out of the game uh, and they just needed a, a headliner for this South American card. <laughs> Shevchenko's big in Peru. So they were like, you'll do. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah, maybe if Kamush can stick to her and, and make a, a grindy fight of it. You know, this is the same girl who uh, got on the back of Ronda Rousey and threatened her at one point. Um, surviving and grinding that's what she does if she just chases after uh valentina with her right hand and valentina keeps circling off and cracking her with kicks and check hooks then it's probably gonna be a much longer night um but then valentina you know one of her surprising strengths the entire time even from like the kaufman fight um has been her ability to to sweep or trip people from the clinch and she's got good top control so um Kamush has a win over it, but I think it's by DQ from Upkick or something, or Legal Upkick or something like that. But um, who knows? At least Kamush is game. And to be fair, uh, is it Weili Zhang, the one who's fighting Andrade? She's game too. You know, it's just kind of like clear that you've... Well, I mean, Tapology has a number two in the flyweight rankings in the world. But when she's only fought like twice in the last two years, two and a half years or whatever... You're going, eh, why, why are we making this fight? It feels a little bit like rushed. You know, there's no build to it. Uh, it really does just feel like a, an opportunity for Valentina Shevchenko to, to win, quote, unquote, at home. <laughs> South America, that's home. Anyway, sorry, I only wanted to do a quick rundown today just because I left it so late. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, ca you know, I'm cautiously excited for this card. I think there's some good stuff on it. Uh, you'll probably get some good finishes out of uh, Garn and um, Rodolfo Vieira if everything goes to plan. Luque versus Perry. I could see that one not ending in a finish, but being an absolute barn burner. And Tisha Torres t occasionally turns up, so that, that could be fun too. Anyway, if you want to get in on the Patreon, read the Cyril Garn study, uh, read all the other stuff I put out for the Patreon boys. Got something else coming the weekend. Um, and, you know, support the podcast. Please do. Uh, if you want to send an email to the podcast, fight's gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. Missed check hooks with Ki's Bless.